you're listening to The Primal Happiness Show, a podcast dedicated to helping you thrive in this crazy modern world. Every Tuesday, we explore the nature of how our minds really work, what exactly the human animal requires to thrive, and how we can live happier and more fulfilling lives. If you're new here and haven't yet taken our free class, then there's no better place to get a jump start on reclaiming your primal happiness. It's where we'll guide you step-by-step through our antidote to today's modern world. Simply head on over to primalhappiness.co slash antidote to get the free class and discover how to thrive without having to move to a planet that's not so crazy as ours. But now, your host, Leanne Brooks Tyler. Hello, my beautiful people. A huge warm welcome back to the show. In today's crazy modern world, men and women are living shallow, disconnected, and unfulfilling lives. So, we created the path for those who are ready to reclaim their wildness and actualize their deepest gift. And the next way that you can walk this path is by joining us for Waking the Wild Medicine, which begins in March. In this crucible, you will uncover the wild medicine of your soul the gift to the world that you came here to be. You'll create the potent ways to administer this medicine via your own unique embodiment in line with divine archetypal energies. You'll be liberated to become the fullest expression of your soul, giving your deepest gifts in service to the world. In material terms, this means you become available for abundance of connection, impact and wealth and anything else your soul desires to flow as you. You can discover more and arrange a call with myself or Jonathan to explore whether this is aligned for you by going to primalhappiness.co slash medicine. And now to this week's show. It's with the infinite couple, Barbara Richard and Sri Namaste. This is them back for, I think it's the third time. We love them. Barbara and Sri are spiritual leaders and relationship alchemists who create a potent pathway to sacred love, business growth and spiritual alchemy. They've worked privately with some of the most exciting individuals and couples throughout the globe. In today's show, we explored the seeming diverging topics of spirituality and wealth, why they're so often seen as mutually exclusive and how actually they can be in deep symbiosis of each other. This was a gorgeously deep show yet again. Oh my goodness. Just Pure wisdom bombs dropping by the minute. Um, I absolutely loved it. I think you will too. Let's dive in. Hello, both of you, and a huge welcome back to the show. Hello. It is a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. (laughs) I feel like we've, just each time, I think like this is just such a juicy topic. We hadn't planned this at all, had we? We jumped on and then I could see when I said, I've got these two ideas. How about this one? I could see you both light up and it was just like, that's the one, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. You picked a good one. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're bringing together two, two ideas, two topics that either aren't ever spoken about in the same breath or when they are, as we were saying, they're often done in a bit of a kind of bypassy, quite shallow way. And yeah. I know that you two, just like me, like to go really deep, really look at things clearly from a first principles mm-hmm. perspective. So I feel like we can have a really fresh and powerful conversation by sort of bringing those two things together and speaking that way. So I can't wait. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and before we really dive in, I would love to know when we're using that word wealth and we're using that word spirituality, what do you mean by those? Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, well, I'll tackle the spirituality one. I think that <laughs> when we use the word spirituality, what we're talking about is the individual relationship with divinity, with the all that is. Mm-hmm. Mm. However, you quantify that presence or that essence or that. Um, ineffableness, you know, when you come into the presence of that, um, that's how we're defining spirituality is that relationship, that give and take, Mm -hmm. that back and forth that a person has throughout their entire life, where they can either choose to acknowledge it or not, but it's still present. Yeah, the the higher self, Mm -hmm. the higher Mm -hmm. self. And when we talk about wealth, we're talking about abundance, 
um, but not just a general abundance, like an abundance of um, oxygen or an abundance of, because we all have abundance in some way, but we are talking about the more grounded, earthy, if you will, type of abundance that is indicative by having, well, a lot of money, a lot of tangible assets, more mm. than what you need and enough to pass on for future generations mm. that are income generating. <clears throat> I love that. More than what you need yeah. and enough to pass on to future generations. Humans have a tendency to want to store value mm -hmm. in various things. And so when we talk about it, that's a real thing, yeah. like a store of value. We want to amass a store of value that we can utilize to um, capture the life of our dreams. Right, you know, right. Do that, which makes us happy and fulfilled and, and, and have that enjoyment at higher and higher levels. Well, in order to do that, you need to have a mass quantity of that store of value. Right. Mm. Not just an intellectual understanding of, yeah, well. The idea of the it. The idea of it, right. And then being able to have that pass on to your generations that follow your legacy, whoever that happens to be. So for some of us, like us, <laughs> we have a lot of children. We have eight children. And so um, while they are all well and truly grown um, from ages 21 up to 33, we look at it, even if you do not have children, what is the legacy and who are you providing for in the future? When you pop out of here and you go and do something else, mm -hmm. um, you know, how does the wealth that you have created continue on to benefit those who come after you, um, mm. who you have entrusted it to? Right. And so that's how mm. that's how we're defining it. Mm -hmm. mm. I love both those definitions. Yeah. There's so. A quick question on the spirituality one, Richard. Um, what word do you personally use when you are talking about, you're talking about, I love the way you're saying it's like your relationship with the divine. Mm -hmm. What word do you, you tend to use for the divine, God, spirit? What, like I what tend, term? What term? Yes. I use the, mm -hmm. the term the divine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more often than not. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Baba usually uses the divine and I usually use intelligent infinity. Mm -hmm. So we don't it's always. Not, oh, you don't yeah, always use both yeah. terms. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. I just wondered. <laughs> um, so it was partly not that I think you would do this, actually, but you know how that sometimes like the God word can be a bit like the elephant in the room. And so I just wanted to understand, like, is that the word you normally use? And then you're not here or that it was just, you know, the things can have baggage. And I just was going to invite you to like, whatever you normally would say, say that, but then I was like, Hey, those two would say whatever they were going to say anyway. I don't need to make right. that invitation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's I a reason it's interesting that you bring that in because there's a reason why we very rarely use the term God. And that's because people, um, that word has such a heavy meaning in mm. our society and everyone projects into that term, um, usually their own baggage, whatever that happens to be. So mm -hmm. if they love it, then it's great, but it also has a very thick meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't love it, they stop listening because it has a very fixed meaning. And mm. so we usually use terms because we believe that what we're talking about is something that is not quantified or qualified by any one religion. We usually use terms that allow people to have a more open hearted experience of it without feeling, without triggering that. Mm. You know, they, There's yeah. that word. There's that <laughs> word. Yeah. I call that the I know, I know trap. You know, it's like when you say God, you know, everyone goes back to whatever, wherever they were raised. And whatever that experience happened to be, and they automatically assume, yes, that's what you're talking about. Right. Yes. And, mm, you know, that yes. may not be at all what I'm talking about. Right, right. In fact, I don't, I don't think that in most of our society, that word almost becomes a pejorative. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. God, severe, stern, authoritarian, you know, it's like hitting you on the head with this cosmic hammer all the time. That's <laughs> not how we, how we, as an infinite couple, that's not how we perceive the divine. Mm, and yeah. so... Yeah, I think it, it bears um, more terms, you know, so we can create a shared language of understanding. But in the creation of that shared language of understanding, it's important that we have an opening that attracts the discussion mm, yes, as opposed yeah. to closing it down. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that really makes sense. 
There's some irony, actually. Um, I think it was you, Namaste, that it, it, you said it has, it gives quite a kind of limited meaning. And I was thinking the irony that something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um actually before we uh, move on, it uh, suddenly occurred to me, I love how you described it as our relationship to the divine. Um it is almost like the bazillion dollar question, but would you also then share your definition of what do you mean by the divine? Mm. What I mean when I say the divine is that presence that I have always recognized as being this emanation of love and understanding and a deep bone level knowingness of me, but at the same time, the invitation to be known as well. So that constant, almost beyond companionship, it's, it's a, um, a pervasive presence that is woven through and into everything that from my earliest remembrance of, you know, asking my parents, what is that? You know, since I was a, a child, I've always felt that presence. Oh, wow. And so that's been a constant, you know, feature or a constant picture in my life. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm so glad I asked you that now. <laughs> yeah, how beautiful. Mm. Thank you. So I heard in what you said namaste about uh, an aspect of wealth is that it's generative and specifically in the way that it can be a legacy that's passed down i'd love to know why you see that's an important aspect of it we were talking just before we started the recording mm -hmm. when i said we want to be recording right. <laughs> <laughs> um i we talked about how you haven't come from a background oh. of wealth mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Why do you see that that is something to, that is important to um, create a legacy where our children have perhaps a different experience to the one that we've had if we haven't come from wealth? Yeah, so I see that as, well, in the one of the sacred texts, it says that a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children, right? On to, what is it, the third or the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. And so the idea being that we have a responsibility to leave not just a storehouse of wisdom and insight and teachings that we've given, but to leave the world a better place for our children so that way they can pick up the baton and continue running mm. where we left off. When we, and especially, you know, we're in the States and um, there is a huge, I don't know about in other, I know in many countries this isn't true, but it is true here. There's a huge push towards like, no, your children should basically start from the ground up just like you did, you know, don't spoil them, don't. Mm -hmm. And we are staunch <laughs> advocates for the complete opposite of that, which is right. if we give our children the benefits of the work that we have done, then they can go forward and do more. So it's building and building and building and building. If every generation has to start from the ground, there's always a cap based on how many, how many years you're gonna live and how much can you do in those years, mm -hmm. right? And so when we look at our children, we can already see, even though we are still here, we can already see how they've grabbed the baton and continued on with how they think, thought, thought processes and, and ideas and, and ways of viewing the world are so different for them than they were for us. Things that we took a long time to come to, they mm -hmm. have it innately, they already know it. They, they're already living it. It doesn't even occur. Uh, failure is not even an option in their minds. Like, mm -hmm. they're like, no, of course I did that. It's what I wanted to do. Like, they just don't even have that as a part of, of how they do things. The other thing is that because of the wealth that we have accrued, they see the world as being, they have access to all of it. Mm -hmm. As opposed to needing to get to a point where they will have access to all of it. Um, I think a third component of that is that when you have that wealth and you are a young person, then what that means is that you can take that and do good with it. So instead of spending time lobbying and 
writing letters and coming on social media complaining and all of these other things you can focus your life on becoming um and, and getting to a place of power you may already have been placed in a plate a position of power and have that amazing network and now you're able to take the resources in the form of money that you have and say now this is what i'm going to do instead of talking about let's save the rainforest i'll just go buy whatever and say no we're not we're not gonna um clear those forests how much more effective is that money makes things possible in ways that just ideas uh can take a lot longer to do mm -hmm. you know if if you're if you're trying to like i want to save the rainforest okay well let's petition and let's say if we can change the laws well yeah that's one way to do it right which in essence is let me find someone with the resources that i can convince to put those resources mm. toward the things I believe that are yes. important. <laughs> yeah, and right? how we look at it is, well, let me have the resources because I am, the, I am only, I can only be responsible for me, right? So if I really wanna see that, let me go and get the resources, let me make the money, let me have the wealth, and then let me do it. I will mm. do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed oh, to mm. turning to someone else to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, wow. Um, I want to come back to something you said at the start of what you said, but just quickly, there was a there was a point some years back where I had the realization of something similar to what you said. It's just like, of course, someone's got to have the money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do, why would I not trust it to be me? Exactly. Like right. it's, yeah. it was a sudden kind of clunk where it's just like. Mm -hmm. I can be totally trusted with all the money. Exactly. I'd make great choices. <laughs> exactly. That's such a beautiful way of putting it because that, you know, that's very similar to how we look at it. It's like we trust ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So because because we trust us and we and we know um what we want to do with it and and it's similar. Um I heard Grant Cardone say something similar, like I trust myself. So of course I'm gonna do amazing things with money. And and I think that when you do really trust yourself, when you haven't bought into the idea that spirituality is over here and being, you know, generous and compassionate and loving and divine and, and aligned with your higher self is over here and all the things that pertain to being a person on this earth and operating in a place of real power, not simply energetic power, mm -hmm. not only emotional power, um, not only spiritual power, but power in the world. Mm -hmm. and influence yeah. and impact and wealth that these two things are diametrically opposed and we don't believe that they were ever supposed to be diametrically opposed we actually believe that they are always supposed to be like this together mm. because one feeds the other right yeah the perception um many people have is that especially for spirituality it's a billowing silk parachute behind you to keep you from getting too much wealth mm. and therefore um, engaging with your lower nature, like, mm. which mm -hmm. implies a tremendous lack of trust in the self. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. mm -hmm. I need God to keep me from doing well, because if I have too much, then of course I'm going to do bad things with it. That's, mm. we are diametrically opposed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We do not believe in that at all. I'm really glad we got yeah, that clear. The <laughs> there was something in the way, um, Namaste, you said something when you were talking about we're not just creating a storehouse of, say, you know, wisdom, spiritual understanding. Um, we're also creating a storehouse of wealth. And there was something about the way you said that that allowed me to suddenly recognize how we do hold that that like we hold these things separate as mm. if why why would we see that the it's obvious that we'd want to create a storehouse of wisdom and <laughs> pass that yeah. down to our children and it, it just suddenly hit me of like it, it only makes sense that we wouldn't want to do that with wealth if we've got mm -hmm. a fear response to wealth. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it, yes. I've, I don't think I've ever seen it quite as clearly like that's the only yeah. way that would make sense that we yeah. would say, and, no, and I wouldn't do, do that, but I would do this. Mm. Yeah, most people do have a fear response when it comes to wealth. I mean, if you think about it, um, one of the things that we do with our students is we talk to them quite a bit about how do you see wealthy people? 
when you look at your languaging and look at the stories, and then we encourage them to look around and, and listen to the narratives that, that you are hearing constantly about the wealthy. Mm. They should be taxed more. They should have to pay more. It's their fault that these things are happening in the world. You want them to make them pay. There's no grace. There's no mm. compassion. There's no understanding of their humanity or, or anything like that. It's just they. And so what we do is we, you know, we kind of explore that. And then we say, well, do you feel like that about us? And they say, well, no, I want all good things for you. And we go, well, we're wealthy. So when you're saying, make them pay, you're talking about me. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I would never want to say that about you. And I said, yeah, but you have to understand that mm-hmm. wealth in the hands of anyone, it's a neutral thing. It's yeah. a neutral thing. Mm-hmm. So you can allow yourself to desire it. And you can also, a part of desiring that and being able to go towards making as much wealth, having as much wealth as you possibly could imagine, and even more than that, a part of that is allowing yourself to let go of the idea that there is something inherently evil, corrupt, Mm. problematic Mm -hmm. about wealthy people, that there is a connection between wealth and being a bad person. You got to let that go. You got to let that go. And that's what drives a lot of the wedge that has been placed between spirituality and wealth is that it's the deification of, mm. of poverty, the deification of struggle, of pain. Mm. Um, and, and also, you know, it's, you know, coming from a Judeo-Christian background, it's a way of keeping you from actually wanting or, or caring about anything here. Because if I don't have anything, then I'm constantly wanting to escape my humanity Mm. to go off to the next place, right? And one of the things that wealth gives you is you start to really enjoy your human experience. And Mm. for a lot of people, that is very scary. They think that you shouldn't enjoy your human experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you really should want to escape it because that's the height of being spiritual. But Mm. we don't believe that. Not at all. Not at all. And it's kind of analogous to what we teach in terms of the sustainability of the relationship dynamic. It's like most people, it's like, what if you had all of your energy to actually enjoy each other all the time, as opposed to working on getting along, which mm. is what passes for relationships in most um, environments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that same thing goes for money. It's like, if you have the person that you are, when you have wealth, you haven't met them yet. They have mm. so, they have refined taste. They enjoy things so much more. You know why? Because they aren't giving any of that energy to how am I going to survive? Right. They mm-hmm. passed that survival thing. And now they're looking at what are the elements that delight me in my thrivingness? Exactly. That is a word. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, I love to anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like, we can coin it. <laughs> yeah. So who am I then? Yeah. And, and what you mm. find, and you'd be pleasantly surprised, is that the wealthiest version of you that's a pretty cool person when you meet them you're gonna like them a lot (laughs) i really love that i really love that that i was just remembering i think it was the conversation we had if it wasn't it wasn't last time it's the time before that where we touched upon fairness and that was a big Mm -hmm. thing for me it was Mm -hmm. i had this until I didn't, till I saw the. <laughs> I saw, till I saw how ridiculous it was. I had a real big fair thing, and mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. came into wealth mm-hmm. as well. Where I had this mm-hmm. sense of, I'm so fortunate. I've got so mm-hmm. many wonderful things mm-hmm. in my life. It doesn't feel fair that I would also have, you know, like way more yeah. wealth yeah. than someone mm-hmm. else. And there was mm-hmm. this sense. It was kind of. It wasn't as um, sort of graspy as guilt right, it right, wasn't so kind right. of like it wasn't I was projecting it was bad it was just this sense of like there's a point where I've got mm-hmm. too much to be able mm-hmm. to kind of like hold this sense I'm also right. fair and it really yes, took yes. me realizing like the fairness thing just is not working for me to right. then you know that really helped kind of collapse yeah. that energetic cap I had mm-hmm. around okay I can only have this much otherwise it's not fair um, right, which I think is another yeah, way, yeah. and I think that shows up for a lot of people who do have 
some sense of kind of spiritual calling, I think that mm-hmm. can come with that sense of life needing to be fair as well, as in right. it's, it's, well, it's yeah. well intended. It's well intended. Yeah, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. I, I felt that was helpful. We went quite deep into that when we last spoke, but right. I feel like that shows right. up quite a lot when it comes to wealth. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I agree. I think it does show up quite a bit when it comes to wealth yeah. because people want to, um, there's a perception that if I just keep having more and more and more, what about the people who don't? Mm-hmm. And um, It's very zero-sum way of looking at it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like we don't make anyone else have a better experience of life by having less. Yeah. In fact, the easiest way for me to assist people and facilitate and support them in having a better experience of life is for me to have as much as possible. Yes. Because mm-hmm. when I have as much as possible, then I can share it mm-hmm. with those who yes. I desire to share it with. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, what's going to be better? I, I could sit in the if someone is sitting in 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 the dirt and they're hungry, I can sit in the dirt with them and be like, oh, my goodness, I feel so bad that you're hungry. Or I can um, feed them because I have a little bit more than they do. So I can share my sandwich with them, right? Mm -hmm. Or I can have a little bit more than that. And maybe, yes, I maybe I, you know, say, okay, well, here's food for a week. Or I can own a factory and give them a job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Or I can own the school and teach them and educate them and show them not only how to have a job, but how to invest and how to build their own companies. Which one, at what level do I really want to assist? Do I just want to satisfy their hunger today? Or do I want to teach them how to live in a thriving, dynamic way where they're actually able to not only have enough, but also contribute more? And I think that's the part that's really missing. I believe wealth is the highest form of charity. Mm. Because when you have a great deal of wealth, then you have a lot to give. When you only have a bit more, than, just a little bit more than I have a cap, this is how much, mm-hmm. then what ends up happening is, yes, the delta between what I need and what I enjoy and then what I actually make, I can give, yes, but if I have a lot more, then I start thinking differently. Mm-hmm. I start saying, you know what? No, I'm not just going to build a house. I'm going to build an apartment building. No, I'm not just going to, you know, have my little boat, my little tiny boat. I'm going to have a, a cruise ship. No, I'm not just going to have an online business. I'm going to own a huge enterprise, an empire. And, and you are changing the world with your being instead of relying on other people agreeing with you. Yeah, to yeah. change the world. Mm. There's no element of sacrifice in your philanthropy. Yes, it's a delight to because I love you're, that. you're at a place of of your store of value or your storehouse, as it were, is large enough to where you're not diminished, and so therefore there's no sacrifice. Therefore, there's no judgment. Right. Because one of the things, whether you're on the wealthy side or on the poor side, that always happens is when you have that guilt. Guilt always, like you say. Guilt demands punishment. Yes, always. So mm. when you are like, well, if I don't give, something bad will happen to me. You know, or if I have, I can only have so much and then no more because, you know, that's problematic. I should be, you know, time and tide, something needs to take me down a peg so that I'm better, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that is antithetical to being able to reach the maximum amount of people possible and give from a place of delight as opposed to a place of sacrifice. Yeah, mm. I love that. Yeah. I heard um, weaved into so much of what you're saying, something that you said before we hit record, uh, Richard, which was, I'm going to paraphrase this, I can't remember the exact word you used, but it was something around um, being kind of like your full expression, having the opportunity mm-hmm. to like be everything you came here to be. You said something like mm-hmm. that. Can you remember how you worded it? Because you named it in a really mm. concise way. Don't worry if you um, can't, but you, do you, you understand the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, going, you know, orienting your compass toward that which is best and highest. Mm. You know, like what's the best and what's the highest version of me? What's the most wealthy version of me? And how much delight can I pack into this experience? Then all sorts of opportunities open up to you mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, looking through the telescope the other way mm-hmm. and saying, you know, the dictates of being a quote unquote good person are so constrictive that, you know, I'm, I'm on that razor's edge and I'm constantly battling as to what the best thing could be. It's like when you're going towards best and highest and most expansive, 
then the best thing to do and to be automatically opens up to you. And that's an easier path to walk down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can't remember which which of you said this, but one of you said something like without wealth, there's always going to be a cap on your yes. beingness a cap on yeah. you know how much you can become who you came yeah. here mm-hmm. to be yeah um, because there's versions of you that you can't even experience there's things you can't experience until you have wealth mm. there's yeah. even spiritual experiences you can't have until you yeah have yes, right. yes yes yeah. yes say more about that i'm feeling something really <laughs> juicy <laughs> well <clears throat> what does wealth provide wealth provides freedom the freedom to do and go and experience and have whatever you desire. The more wealth you have, the more things you can, you can not only aspire to, but you can also experience, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to have the experience of going to this portal in Egypt, the spiritual portal in Egypt. Okay. And it's only open, you know, it happens on a specific day. And there are things like this on a specific day in Egypt, and you have to pay a specific amount to get as close as possible. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the money, you don't get to access that experience. Now, does that mean you are a lesser caliber of person? No, Mm -hmm. it does mean that that's an experience that you're just not gonna get to have, Mm -hmm. right? When you have a great deal of wealth, you start operating differently. You start looking at things differently and it it actually increases your compassion compassion and mm-hmm. your understanding because you understand oh wait all of this time like for for me coming from a position of not growing up wealthy my 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 family generationally had wealth but my grandmother got married when she was very young and basically got written out of all the family everything it was like no you don't get access to that and so she that that decision actually put us on a trajectory for really struggling when i was growing up financially And there were a lot of things that I just never experienced. There were things that was like, oh, okay, now my mom did the best she could. I took ballet lessons and things of that nature, very short term because money, right? When we shifted, as as we got, as Richard and I became more and more wealthy, my mind was expanded because of the experiences that I could have, number one, and my desire to be fully all in those experiences Mm. and my willingness to allow my mindset to shift. So for instance, as our company got bigger and we began to have a team that was answerable to us, we get a different perspective on all the companies that we worked for before we were CEOs. Mm -hmm. We understood, oh, wow, you know what? You're making decisions from a different place. You're not deliberately trying to irritate anybody or anything like that, but you have Mm -hmm. to be the visionary and it's your responsibility to hold the vision. And you need people who can go along with that. But when I was in the position of being the employee, it just seemed like, why are you making my life difficult? I don't understand why you're Mm -hmm. asking me these questions. Like, don't you, I couldn't see it from that place because I was here and the positions were different. The same thing happened with money. Yeah. We realized how many things were just social economic. A lot of people don't understand that even things that they think are racism based, it's not a racist thing. It's a social economic thing. Mm -hmm. No one's keeping you from it because you happen to have more melanin in your skin. You're not being allowed access to those things. It's not about being allowed. It's just that you can't access it because you don't have the income increase your income and you'd be shocked at how wide the doors fly open. Mm -hmm. And we know this from personal experience, right? So it's just, there are so many things in that same realm. When I think about the, the, the retreats we've gone to and, and the different um, coaching and mentoring that we've Mm -hmm. had from these really high caliber thought leaders. Um, Just a few days ago, we went and saw Jordan P. Peterson and, um, B. Peterson, uh, Dr. Peterson, he came, he's on tour and we were at his first tour stop here in Austin, Texas in the third row. Money, wealth allows you to get those types of tickets and have those types of experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, could you just read his book? Yeah. Is seeing him in person a completely different experience? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are experiences that enrich you, that develop you, that expand you and expand your human experience and also your divinity, your connection with your divinity. 
that you simply don't access when you're struggling to make ends meet, or even if you're just like, well, I've got a little bit, mm -hmm. you just don't have access to that at that point. And, and I think sometimes people don't want to talk about that because it makes them feel bad. Like, well, no one likes to know that I don't have access to things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing too, is that not only are you receiving those, those high level potent experiences for yourself, but wealth also allows you to be a vector for those experiences for those around you. Yeah. Like for mm -hmm. instance, if you are a server in a restaurant, for instance, and you're having a bad day, then coming in contact with the infinite couple at your table is going to change your perception of the previous hostile universe you used to live in. Mm -hmm. Because when we pay for our $22, you know, whatever croissant and whatever, and we give you a hundred dollar tip, that all of a sudden you're going to perceive where you are differently. You're going to feel yeah. differently about mm -hmm. that. You're going to be like, wow, you know what? You know, things are looking up. Why are things looking up? This couple came in, they were real cool and they gave me a hundred dollar tip on a $20 bill. It's like, <laughs> really? Yeah. You, and so the, so from that point forward, you start looking at your own life and your own experiences differently. Why? Because of that one intersection. Oh, yeah. I love that. We always say when you come in contact with us, your day just got better. Like yeah. anybody who serves us, it's like, like <laughs> your day just got immeasurably better. better. You don't realize it yet, but you just got, you're going to have a good day today. Yeah. And you didn't even know that that's what yeah, was going to happen. Yeah, able to do that. 100, 200, $500. And, and it's like, it, cha it changes somebody's perspective from yeah. that point forward. Because even if it never happens again, they're always anticipating that it might. It could. And that anticipation, yeah. yes. that, you know, that, that good yeah. feeling tends yeah. to perpetuate itself and go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that so much. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm noticing the time and thinking, I feel like I'm so in agreement. I'm not asking any hard questions. And I'm, I'm, tr I'm thinking like, ask hard questions. <laughs> given what we're talking about, isn't kind of like known out there. There must be questions I should be asking where listeners are going to be like, why didn't you ask them? But it's like, I'm so like, yeah, yeah, of course. It's not occurring to me. So I'm just going to name that and hope one of us can think of something. <laughs> um, and then there was something, oh gosh, what was it? Hmm. There was something I wanted to come back to, but I'm going to pause that for a moment. What would you say is, ah, oh, I know what it was. These are maybe linked actually. So in your work, you're talking to people who aren't yet seeing what you're seeing. And mm -hmm. what would you say you've named some of the, some of the things that are kind of blockers to that, you know, that guilt and that projection on people who do mm -hmm. have wealth. We talked about the fairness mm -hmm. thing. Is there anything else you'd say comes up as reasons why what you're saying isn't a good thing? So mm -hmm. is there anything else? Because I really feel that I'm, again, it's like everything you're saying is just music to my ears. And I feel like mm -hmm. there's something listeners might be thinking yeah. and I don't know what it is. So if you've got uh -huh. a, a insight on that, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we have, you know, our audience is comprised, I think about like maybe a third or a quarter of our audience are people who are just now beginning to come into this idea of wealth. Mm -hmm. And then we have a fair amount of people who are on an entrepreneurial journey. So they they're doing okay, a lot of them. And then we have, um, you know, maybe a third or a quarter who are doing very, very well, right? And they get it 100%. So we have everybody in that full spectrum. And But the people who are at this, the side where they're really, like, they might like the idea, but they, it's very difficult for them to implement it or apply it to their lives enough where they're actually going to see the results and live it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's an idea that sounds nice, almost like Nirvana they can't see past their own experience. Yeah. Mm. That sounds nice and it must be easy for you to say and, and what have you, but you don't understand how hard my life has been. You don't yes. understand. Mm. Like I, I would like the idea of this, but it's just, so it's two things either. It's just, this is so hard for me, but a lot of times that this is so hard for me is also like the, the thing that's happening and it's actually wrapped around this other idea, which is that, well, what about people who don't get that? And that goes back to the fairness thing, but it's actually more than just fairness because mm -hmm. there's a, there's like this belief that based on the fact that there are people in the world who don't have it and who don't get it, 
that means that I can't have it and I can't get it either. Or I can use that as the excuse mm -hmm. for why I don't. Mm. And, and a lot of, you know, what we really. So can I just check, understand, do you mean. Yes, yes. As in, that's almost just like natural law that some mm -hmm. people won't and therefore. Yeah. I may be, I'm one of them. Is I'm it? one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing that in as yeah. almost like an independent standard, right? Yeah, it's like the happy yeah. accident. It's, it's the happy accident of theology that Baba talks about quite a bit, which is when good things happen, they're just happy accidents. So mm. good on you that that happened yeah. for you, mm -hmm. but you have to realize that that can't happen for everyone. Gotcha. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I have plenty of proof because why I shouldn't even necessarily even go in the direction of doing mm. the actions that would create that because so many people, if this was real, wouldn't all these people have done it? Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, even though so we have all of proof. these people yes. who have, but let's <laughs> yeah. not look at those people. Let's yes. look at the people who mm. haven't, right? And these yes. are good people. Mm. That's the thing. These are good people. And so what, what, how could we even argue with that? And to which we say them, draw them the cosmic donut yeah the cosmic donut you want to talk about the cosmic donut yes okay um the cosmic donut is this <laughs> oh i don't want to hear about the cosmic donut <laughs> 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 it's calorie free it's calorie free it's made with love and this is what it is you picture this donut right make it whatever size you want um and it's comprised of those two rings there's a small inner ring that circle is where there's a small tiny one in the middle and then the larger, bigger ring on the outside. That big ring on the outside, those are all the things that you're interested in. Those are ideas that are floating around. Those are all the things that distract you and beckon for your attention, et cetera, right? And that's a huge energy suck. That small circle in the middle, those are the things that you can control. Mm -hmm. those, that's your locus of control. Those are the things you can actually do something about. Mm -hmm. When you are telling me about all the people in the world who don't have, and using that as a rationale or justification for something, mm -hmm. you're in that big circle. Wow. Nobody oh, can yeah, do anything about that. that big mm -hmm. circle. Right. 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 But what can you do about that small circle, the things that you can control? You can have more tomorrow than you have today. Mm -hmm. You can learn the skills, abilities, et cetera, to improve your state. Mm -hmm. You can acquire wealth, mm -hmm. acquire knowledge. You can do all sorts of things, mm -hmm. but you got to stay in that circle because that's the circle in which you have power and presence and potency when you're big circle thinking all these intractable ideas what about everybody else in the world you can't do anything about that that's beyond your locus of control and as you were saying that baba something just brought i love in. the cosmic donut by the way <laughs> <laughs> me too me too <laughs> and, and, and there, there's something about that that um that i've never seen before but it just dropped in was that for a lot of people, when you're talking about that little circle mm -hmm. and, and recognize that things in a little circle are yours, they are putting, and this really connects to spirituality and wealth, and this is so powerful, they're putting their wealth creation in that big circle. Mm -hmm. Because they're thinking that my ability to create wealth is not based on me, it's based on the divine. Uh, yeah. And so... If the divine wants me to have wealth, and this is a very common thing in spiritual circles and especially in religious circles, so you can mm -hmm. be spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, um, but we even find it in like light worker circles or what have you is, you know, if spirit source, my angels, my avatars, my ancestors, whomever wants me to have wealth, mm -hmm. Then I then it'll just come to me. It'll mm. be the divine imposition. Oh yes, right? yes, it yes. It will be imposed mm. upon my right. Life. Yeah. And mm. and I shouldn't do anything of myself. Yes. To seek to create that. I just so surrender. I should just surrender, will. and it'll <laughs> just come. Mm -hmm. And um mm -hmm. and I think what you know this is bringing up something a conversation I had recently where I was talking to someone who has a lot of gifts, a lot of talents, a lot of abilities. And they've tried many things over the years and they were saying, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of stuck and kind of struggling with this because I feel like I've tried so many things and nothing ever came of them. Um, and, and, I, and, and, um, and so I was telling them, you know, you have to be willing to try again and things of that nature. Um, and then they had to go. But what I would say to anyone, because this is coming up, so I know there are other people who feel that way, is that. You don't know what you don't know. And the ability to use your gifts, talents, and abilities 
and just put them out into the world is a different skill set than the skill set of creating wealth. Those aren't necessarily mm-hmm. the same thing. Mm-hmm. And you don't yes. have to tie them together. And so understand that you can be an amazing healer, an amazing oracle reader, an amazing you know, psychic or um, thought leader, and you speak and consciousness, and you can be amazing at all those things and have no idea how to build wealth yes. in using mm-hmm. that or using anything else. Mm-hmm. And so what I would say is that if you've been struggling with that, if you've been, you know, I'm doing, I'm putting my stuff out there and I'm just not making the money. I'm just not getting the amount of money that I want. I'm not cre- generating the wealth that I desire. Then what you want to lean into is specifically education on how to create wealth, mm. not more education on the thing that is your gift, talent, or ability, because those Brilliant. are not the same mm. skill sets. Very, very different things. Yeah. Yes, I love that so much. So yeah. I was going to ask you as a closing question, but I feel that you've actually seen the future and kind of named it already. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, so for those listening that are like, oh, okay, this now feels like something I do want to choose into, what would you suggest to them? But I was thinking what you've just said, I think so perfect. It's recognizing that of course, there, this is an energetic move and an energetic understanding, mm-hmm. but it also requires real world skills. And I love the way wow. you said specifically, there is a skill, um, an understanding of how mm-hmm. to generate wealth that isn't, mm-hmm. isn't just going to happen on its own just because you right. get really good at doing <laughs> your thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, we see it all the time. We, we, we work with people in business and, um, and they're very good at what they do they're not very good at business. Mm -hmm. Um, They're very good at, you know, they're excellent. I mean, you can do a reading with them and it would knock your socks off or, you know, whatever the thing, they're amazing coach. But when it comes to the business aspect of it, they don't really have much in that bucket. And they actually start seeing the idea of of doing things as a business as being in some way um, a limitation or Mm -hmm. in some way demeaning or devaluing the other things that they're doing as far as coaching. And you know, one of the things that we do and that we actually gave to our children was this idea. So we'll give it to all of your listeners as well, which is that you do not have to connect how you create wealth to your gifts, talents, your gifts and talents that you enjoy doing. In mm-hmm. other words, you can enjoy being a coach. You can enjoy writing books. You can enjoy meditating and doing yoga and, and, and being a yogini and all of those amazing things that you enjoy doing those all the hiking on mountains whatever you enjoy doing you don't have to monetize every gift Mm -hmm. what you can do is you can make your wealth over here Mm -hmm. and then put your things out into the world over there you can use this wealth to do the thing that you really love to do and that is where it gets really Mm -hmm. juicy right so you can get into cryptocurrency or nfts or you know you can just find an industry that's like man this industry is really popping let me get involved in it and use it as a vector for my wealth. And then I will use my wealth to build my passion project. I will use my wealth Mm -hmm. to change the world. I will use my wealth to put forward the things that I really want to see in the world. You don't have to connect them to be the same thing anymore. Mm. And that is the quantum that we're living in right now. Mm, I love that. Would you say that for those who i'm trying to think if the question about to ask makes sense what i guess i was i was seeing was how some of us it almost feels like intertwined like the ability to generate wealth feels very intertwined with our gifts anyway Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. i was thinking what you're saying still feels like Mm -hmm. it's um, another opportunity Mm -hmm. it's like you can do that as well. I'm not really asking yeah. you permission. Can we do that as well? But I was just seeing like, mm-hmm. of course, that makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. why limit how mm-hmm. we generate wealth? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. exactly. Well, what we're finding is, okay, so most of us grow up and our parents teach us to get a job, but why are you getting a job? So you can make money, you can, make so money. You can provide mm-hmm. for yourself, yeah. right? And so, so you don't have to like hate your life. You want to get a job doing something that you kind of like doing at least, right? And so that's a specific kind of framework. 
So when we, even when we begin to, for many of us, when we begin to become entrepreneurs or we, you know, we want to have a laptop lifestyle or whatever, we still are following that same model. Mm -hmm. So now only now, instead of doing it and working for someone else, what I'm going to do is I'll take the thing that I really love to do and I'll use that as the means by which I make money, Mm -hmm. which can work if and when it works. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that you might love to do that simply aren't income generating. They're like, Mm -hmm. you love that. That's awesome. I want you to put that in the world. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to pay for that though. It just means it needs to be in the world. And so Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, there's a power in, I I found that there's a power in unhooking those two things and saying, you know Mm -hmm. what, I'm going to put anything and everything out into the world that I feel needs to be in the world and the things that are monetizable, I will monetize. But even if it's not monetizable, if I want it in the world, I'm going to put it out because I also have all of these other areas that I can generate wealth as well. Mm. So I don't have to let that be the determiner. Can I make money from it? Then I'll do it. No, I'll do it because I want to do it. And I make wealth because I want to make wealth. And when those two things are the same thing. Awesome. And when they're not, they're still complementary. They're still supporting mm. each other. You see? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a, that's a true abundance mindset, isn't it? Yes. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I got that from him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I love this conversation. I really have. Is there, is there anything you think would be a helpful way to close this? Any, any, um, any more kind of cosmic donuts or anything of that kind that you really feel we're powerful to leave listeners with? Well, what I would say is that, you know how you expand the circle, that small circle in the middle of the cosmic donut, is that you expand that by having courage to realize the threshold or the event horizon of your own ignorance. Mm. Because desiring wealth and wanting wealth and being educated and knowing exactly how to do it are two different things. Mm. If you just have the desire, but you don't have the knowledge, then that's, that just leads to frustration. Mm-hmm. You're like, this mm-hmm. isn't working, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? This is a really handy sentence. I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. I don't know yeah. what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So what's the answer to that? Let me find out. Right. So in yes. order to find out, maybe I need to have the courage to ask questions. I need to have the courage to reach out to somebody who knows more, who's at a level higher than I'm at, so, you know, it's like this whole idea of pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Mm. Yeah, you know what? I don't want to learn, you know. Yeah, you can learn from your own mistakes, but you know what? It was really cool learning from other people's mistakes. <laughs> you know what? The people who have more wealth than you can teach you is how to avoid the, state, the mistakes that they've already made. Yes. Mm. And yes, they yes. can pass that knowledge on to you. Now you go back to your circle more equipped to expand it because now you know what you're doing. Mm. And that's when the fun really starts. Mm. But that takes oh. courage. Mm-hmm. It takes courage to look at that and say, you know what, yeah. I'm bigger in a lot of areas. Oh, I'm so glad I asked you that last question. <laughs> 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 this has been fabulous. And uh, I'm sure listeners will want to find out more about you and your gorgeous work and your upcoming beautiful new website. Where can they find mm-hmm. all of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we are at infinitecouple.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a new program coming up called the Infinite Life Experience. And it's all mm. about spending a year with us where we take you through building all the aspects of your life, your relationship that, you know, we say have the amazing relationship, you know, mm-hmm. um, create the legacy and live the luxury lifestyle all through spirit, source and love. And so um, you can find all of that at infinitecouple.com. And we are also on Facebook, on Instagram, and every place else as The Infinite Couple. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. This really has been such a pleasure. You know, us as well. Us as we well. enjoyed it as well. Yeah, yeah, we love it. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. What a gorgeous episode. Here are my takeaways. I loved what they said about creating a storehouse to pass on to the next generation. Instead of passing on wisdom, but not wealth, why wouldn't we pass on the richest storehouse of everything we can so the next generation can grab the baton and continue the great work? Wealth opens up possibilities for us to have specific spiritual experiences that we're being called to 
and to embody a deeper expression of divine love in the world. Rich's analogy of the cosmic donut is wonderful. When we focus on the inner ring, we have power to make choices about our life. And if you trust your soul, then you can also trust yourself to have wealth and make beautiful choices about what to do with it. If you'd like to get the notes and links for everything we spoke about this week, hop on over to the show notes and they're at primalhappiness.co slash episode 353. And if you are feeling the call to be your medicine, go take a look at primalhappiness.co slash medicine now and you can book your call with myself or Jonathan to explore fully if indeed it is aligned for you to join us. If you don't want to miss out on next week's episode, head on over to Apple Podcast Stitcher or your app of choice and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll get each episode straight to your device as soon as it's released. Thank you so much for listening. You've been wonderful. Catch you again next Tuesday.